Good evening. I'm Lisa German, University Librarian and Dean of the Libraries at the University of Minnesota, and I am delighted to welcome you to Behind the Headlines, Reporters and News Consumers in a 24 by 7 media world. First, let's handle a couple of housekeeping matters. We ask that you remain muted throughout the program. You'll notice two buttons at the bottom of your screen. Please use the chat button if you have technical questions and the Q&A button if you have questions for the panelists. You may submit your questions at any time and we'll get to as many as possible after the discussion. Before we begin, I'd like to share a perspective that's important to all of us. As you may know, the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus is located on traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous people. Dakota land ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. Acknowledgement of this complex and layered history is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationship with it and each other. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. I appreciate this opportunity to look closely at reporters and the news. We have seen a profound transformation in the news media, everything from moving to a 24 seven news cycle to recent misinformation campaigns. In the face of such competition and confusion, how do journalists define their jobs now? Does our training of journalists have to change? And how can we who consume the news figure out which reporters are reliable? How do we choose which voices to listen to? And in cases where it's not clear who's offering the news, how do we know if the source is credible? Obviously, I have lots of questions and I am excited to hear our experts offer their insights this evening. To introduce them is Cody Hennessy, our journalism and digital media librarian. Cody? Thank you, Lisa, and thanks to everyone for joining us for tonight's panel conversation. So I'm really pleased and excited to introduce the program, which I'd like to do with just a very brief origin story. So the program was actually stimulated by a Twitter exchange between two of our panelists tonight, um, Kelly Smith and Lindsay Matz Benson. About a year ago, Kelly was tweeting to share information about a partnership between Google and the Star Tribune to promote um, news literacy in Minnesota. And Lindsay replied to suggest, and I quote, Maybe they could also partner with a local university with a journalism school and amazing librarians passionate about this topic. So I wonder who fits this bill? Well, just coincidentally, the University of Minnesota has the excellent Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and Lindsay is one of our amazing librarians. So we didn't have to stretch very far from that initial tweet as we conceived the evening's program. So with support of the Hubbard School and adding the expertise of Gail Golden from Hubbard, who also joins us tonight on the panel, it's really nice to see this come to fruition. Without further ado, let me introduce our speakers for the evening. They'll each speak, speak for about 10 minutes before we have a bit of conversation and then open it up to everyone here um, for questions. So Lindsay Matz Benson has been an instructional designer for the University of Minnesota Library since 2012. Lindsay teaches students how to effectively search for and evaluate information that they use in their course research projects and how those skills and values can be used in their daily lives. Gail Golden, who is known as Gigi, is senior lecturer and a Morse alumni distinguished university teacher at the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication, where she's guided student journalists for more than two decades. A professional journalist since 1983, she's won national awards for her work as a science writer with the Dallas Morning News and has freelanced for a wide variety of publications, including the New York Times and Texas Monthly. And Kelly Smith is a news reporter for the Star Tribune Metro team, covering nonprofits and philanthropy. She's been at the newspaper for 10 years, covering everything from K-12 education to the city and county government. So to start us off, please welcome Kelly Smith. Thanks, Cody, and thank you guys for having me today. Um, see, I guess in that introduction, Twitter isn't all bad, that Twitter brought us all here today, so that's exciting. 
Um, well, I'm going to start off by addressing the elephant in the room, which is COVID. You know, the whole reason we're here on Zoom is because of COVID. And the pandemic has obviously been influencing every sector in the country, but journalism is not alone in that. So first of all, just to back up, newspapers like the Star Tribune rely on revenue from two different sources, advertising and subscriptions. And over the years, we've shifted how we rely on that revenue so that we rely more on subscribers versus advertising revenue. I think our publisher recently said our, our ad revenue is about 50% and our circulation revenue is about 50% now whereas 20 years ago, it was 80-20. And so over time we've, we've shifted, which is why people get the annoying uh, or perhaps to them annoying alerts saying, please subscribe when you reach our paywall. So what happened during COVID is ads just completely evaporated. And so newspapers that had been relying on ad revenue were suddenly in a very tough financial situation and really accelerated the financial decline of a lot of newspapers. Just during COVID, just during this year, several newspapers across Minnesota have closed. The Hastings Star Gazette, which started back in 1857, the Eden Prairie News, the Lakeshore Weekly, which was in the West Metro, the Bulletin of Woodbury and Cottage Grove, and the Lake County News um, Chronicle in Duluth, just to name a few. Just I think last week in Minneapolis, the Southwest Journal announced that they'll be closing at the end of the year. So even if you don't live in any of these communities, why you should care about this sad trend is that in a lot of communities, especially in rural America, the vanishing of newspapers is creating what we call news deserts. And that just means that there's no daily news. There's no news source in that community. So there's no reporter going out to the city council meetings and covering those, the county board meetings, the school board meetings, seeing where your local taxpayer money is being spent. There's no one covering the high school sports in those communities, or there's no place for those paid obituaries. So there's really a huge loss in those communities um, that lose newspapers. In the last 15 years, more than 2,000 newspapers have merged or closed in the US, and about 30% of those are in rural areas. And researchers um, who are studying this have found that when local newspapers close, that fewer people end up voting, fewer people end up running for local office, office, and cities end up approving higher bond spending, perhaps because there's less scrutiny on where that that public money is going. So there's a huge financial cost to local communities. Even the Star Tribune, which has um, been fairly financially stable in the last few years, we've even had some pain over the years. We used to have about 380 journalists back in 2006 in our newsroom, and now we have about 240. And just this year with COVID-19 and, and the loss of adver advertising dollars, we all took furloughs. And of course, our newsroom has been working remotely since March, just like a lot of uh, organizations um, across different sectors. So I just want to talk a little bit about how newspapers work, how the news happens from um, a story idea to showing up on your doorstep. I know there's some journalism students on tonight who probably already know a lot of this, but perhaps there's folks on here who, who don't know a lot about the behind the scenes process. So as newspapers, we operate 365 days a year. People are always surprised to know when we're open on holidays. Our newsroom is open almost 24 hours a day. And throughout the newsroom, we have beat reporters like me um, who are assigned a specific topic so as Cody mentioned, I cover nonprofits now. And as beat reporters, we're supposed to be mini experts on these topics um, and follow, you know, if we're covering the city council, we're following those city council agendas. We establish sources, we receive a lot of press releases. And so we end up pitching story ideas to our editor. We write, do the reporting, write the story, turn it into our editor. Then it goes off to our copy desk where a designer places the story on the page. And then we have a copy editor who goes through and they're fact checking all of those names, those critical facts, you know, accuracy is absolutely paramount for journalists. And so 
having that extra set of eyes to go through and make sure did every name get spelled correctly? Did we get those key facts right? Um, and the copy editor is the one who actually writes the headlines and the captions. And then it goes off to our printing press in the North Loop. A uh, little known fact, we actually have two different editions, one that goes out to greater Minnesota and one out to the Twin Cities. And that's based off of the fact that delivery trucks need more time to obviously get to other communities outside of the Twin Cities. So this plays a big factor coming up here in election night. Um, the polls close at 8 p.m. and our first deadline's at nine o'clock. So we're rushing as reporters to do reporting as fast as we can um, and turn in that story by nine. Well, oftentimes, especially in local races, the results aren't known by nine o'clock. And so we'll write a story for Greater Minnesota saying, here is the race between these two candidates. And we didn't know the results as of um, our deadline. And then we'll have an hour between nine and 10 to then update that story with the results. Hopefully that, hopefully that they'll come in and get gather quotes. And it's, it's a very tight deadline, but um, we actually do tours of our, of our um, printing press, which is in the North Loop, or we did actually before COVID. And hopefully that will resume after COVID if you're ever interested in checking it out. It's very fascinating. It's like Disneyland for journalists seeing the robots carrying the, the paper rolls around the printing press. Um, but now I just want to talk a little bit quickly about the ethical policies that journalists follow. So when people talk about the media, um, you know, in quotes media, it means a lot of different things and not all media organizations follow the same ethical standards. So the Star Tribune, um, just like NPR, WCCO, basically any mainstream media organization, we follow a code of ethics by the Society of Professional Journalists. And you can look up this code of ethics or we can put it in the chat um, at spj.org. And that code of ethics guides a lot of the principles for journalists. We also follow pretty common standards like um, we need to remain totally objective um, we can't participate in political events, protests, you know, we can't put a yard sign up in our yard for a political campaign. We can't put a bumper sticker on our car for a political candidate. We need to remain objective at all times. Um, another key point is that we don't pay for information. So for instance, our restaurant critic who before COVID would be reviewing 200 restaurants a year, we pay for all those meals. We don't expect free meals in exchange for a review. I'm writing a travel story for this weekend. I paid for my lodging, my hotel, my um, meals and everything. We don't get free or special treatment because we're doing that story. Um, and this is different, you know, some, some major TV networks will pay for, you know, photos or specific interviews. We will never do that. We, we don't want to um, alter that perception of objectivity if we're exchanging money. Um, and we have to identify all of our sources and our stories. So this played out actually in 2016 when Prince died um, here in Minnesota who was the first news outlet to or, or organization to reveal that Prince had died. It wasn't a Minnesota news organization, it was TMZ. And TMZ can pay and has, has been notorious for paying sources for information, ambulance workers or prison guards or, or who, whoever, um, and they don't need to list their sources. They just can say sources said. And so at the Star Tribune, we have a much higher bar for reporting that information. So it's just important that when you are talking about the media that you know who you're talking about and that you can decipher between different media organizations. On Instagram, you know, Instagram influencers can pay uh, or receive money in exchange for posting about a hotel stay or, or a meal. And we can't do that as reporters. So just wanna be clear that there are these different ethical standards that are important to understand. And I think that's all the time I have. So I'm gonna quickly pass off the mic to Gigi. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Um, I'm delighted. Um, I, I wanna start just by uh, recalling that not long ago, I was walking down the hall of my home past the office of my husband who uh, is working from home. And he's a pretty experienced investigative journalist in the, news, in the Twin Cities. 
And he called out casually to me the kind of question that you might hear in other households, like, you know, where are the light bulbs? But he said to me something, you know, it's pretty common. He said, you know, what's the difference between truth and facts? Not unusual for us. I answered, of course, I said, a fact is true, but truth requires more than facts. You know, my answer seemed truth and true enough at the time, um, but you know, the matter is really a lot more complicated. And, and I'd, I'd like you to bear with me while I elaborate just a little bit before I get on to talking about what we do at the Hubbard School to address this with our students, because it's much more complex now than I think it used to be. I, and I've been there a while, so I, I, I think I have some perspective on this. Truth requires some emotional investment, some kind of faith, some kind of element of belief in credibility beyond just the bare facts themselves. You know, in 1967, Hannah Arendt pointed this out in her famous essay, Truth in Politics in the New Yorker. She said, facts are stubborn things, yes, but they are also fragile things. Unlike a mathematical proof or a philosophical principle, which hold fasts during disputes. Facts are tied to events or human affairs. Those can be forgotten or dismissed by people who find them inconvenient. And journalism is the act of verifying facts through documents or witnesses and assembling them into proper truthful narratives. But as we have seen these days, if those proper truthful narratives don't suit opinions, facts can be challenged, documents challenged, witnesses challenged, the entire narrative itself challenged to support alternative facts or opinions. And the mere act of challenging something has become a way of suggesting other truths. And if truth is just one narrative, what does that mean for us? You know, of course it means trouble for our democracy, yes? And it means some difficulty for me as someone tasked with preparing future journalists. As last Sunday's New York Times Magazine noted in a story about nothing less than the problem of the First Amendment, it's an article of faith in the United States that more speech is better and that the government should regulate it as little as possible. We've, we've built you know, our assumption on that. But in the United States and other democracies, there's a different kind of threat, which may be doing more damage to the discourse about politics, news, and science. It encompasses the mass distortion of truth and overwhelming waves of speech from extremists that smear and distract. You can read that story in the magazine and you can, you can have whatever opinion you want about it. The reality is today that teaching students to do journalism in this environment is mighty challenging. But of course it is, in my opinion, even more important. So the question was asked of me, how do I do that? And I really can just offer just a few principles that that I, that I have followed for a number of, of years, and I hope it's adequate. It, sometimes it doesn't feel adequate. One of the things that I do is I teach students the elements of journalism that Rosenstill and Kovic developed years ago, and they've really held true and steady. There are uh, five, the first five are really worth mentioning, and, and, and I'm gonna put them in the chat for everybody to see. You can, you can access them, so you could read through those. Um, the, the really important ones um, are that a journalism's first obligation is to the truth and that in fact, our democracy depends upon having reliable, accurate facts put into a meaningful context. So it, it, it's not about the truth being beside the point. We actually are in pursuit of it. The second one is that our first loyalty is to citizens, that's it. And that will become important as we, as we talk about uh, further about this. The third is that the act, what I'm teaching them to do is to follow a set of practices whereby they're verifying what they find. And all of those things involve, you know, seeking out witnesses, disclosing sources and so forth. So people like to talk about biased journalists. The fact is nobody doesn't have biases. It's that the method that they're using is the objective part. The journalist doesn't have to be objective. The journalist can recognize biases but practice an objective method. And it also involves independence from those you cover and independently monitoring power. I teach them to ask basic questions, but I think more importantly than, than that, to ask questions. Young people have been taught to the test. 
they come up through K through 12 and they're terrified of asking questions. They really are, they, they've been asked to give answers. And I tell them, look, no stupid questions. I love the stupid questions. It's important for them to force their ignorance out into the open. It feels very risky to them, but I need to give them confidence to questions. I like to say to them, not all questions have an answer, but all answers have a question. So just ask. And asking questions is really the first big step to teaching the skills of critical thinking. I try to teach them to be curious and inquisitive. Um, I like to ask them to do what I call curiosity fartlicks, which is like interval training. Go one block, go ahead and veg out. The next block that you're walking, ask a million questions around, around you. It's the same as when a runner will run a hard distance and then not run and then run a hard distance. I want them to do curiosity blocks where they're asking questions about everything. You know, and I, and I tell them to do this and, and, and at least I get them to wonder about me. And so maybe that's a first step toward curiosity. I like to teach them to understand news as a thing to understand. Many students regard consuming news on social media as like driving a car. They don't have to think about what's carrying them along, whatever, it's just under the hood. I'll keep reading this story. I won't think about how it's constructed. I won't think about rely, you know, I won't, I'm, in the same way that I'm driving a car, I won't think about how what's operating under the hood. But the problem with that is that you could be reading something that's not too reliable. So I like to think about getting them to think about the sourcing, the motives of sources, the biases, the process itself. I want them to analyze the process that journalists go through to build a story. And I want them to see how a story is constructed, to see how it, what might be missing, to understand what a, a question that might not uh, have been asked. And it, what's really important is to ask them to diversify their news diets. What aren't they reading that they should be reading? Um, so it's, I think it's uh, important to ask them um, also what they mean and I, and I would challenge all of you listening, what do you mean when you use the term news media? Are you talking about the Star Tribune? Are you talking about the New York Times? Are you talking about the Guardian or the BBC? Are you talking about cable news networks in the evening? Because those are all very different kinds of news organizations delivering different kinds of content. Um, so I think it's important to be discriminating when you think about what exactly is being delivered to you. We build their skills carefully. We, we, we certainly do what any journalism school does, but I think I wanna also say that the Twin Cities is such an incredibly rich media environment um, that we really try to take advantage of it so that when we build the skills and have students practice their intermediate development, by the time they near graduation, our students are in newsrooms and TV stations, and we've continued that um, remotely during the pandemic. So we have students working <clears throat> in newsrooms and we're very grateful that the Star Tribune is one of our partners. Um, I think it's really important to have young journalists learning side by side from professionals and working as journalists as much as possible. And the reason that's important is because um, the populated newsroom where I learned so much as a young journalist by observation is, is increasingly not happening now. Newsrooms, as you heard before, are not as populated. So we always have to find ways that young journalists can get closer to professional journalists. I, I think what I wanna say too, is that media literacy more broadly at the, at the college level is not just important for journalism students. It's really important for all of our students. Um, and we really need to extend it beyond the School of Journalism and extending this kind of awareness to non-journalism uh, students is really the same kind of work that I described. Um, last year at this time, I taught a freshman seminar with a small number of students and I used the same strategy. They really responded to the elements of journalism and analyzing bias and diversifying their news diets. They really enjoyed looking under the hood of how stories came together. And they really appreciated being able to practice asking questions. It's something that they really got, got good at. Um, I think it was harder to turn them off of their polarizations um, and, on stories. Um, maybe that was natural, but all of them recognized to some degree the importance of doing so. And I think um, it really argues for the importance of media literacy at the university level. Um, I don't know where I am on time. Um, am I good? Have I done it? 
I think um, I think I have. So I think we can talk more about this later. Now, please welcome Lindsay Matz Benson. Thank you, Gigi, and thank you, Kelly. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so. I realize that my job title doesn't necessarily always explain what I do. So at the university, it's my job among the job of others to educate students on how to be effective consumers and citizens of information. Not just to teach students how to be good researchers and find the right scholarly articles, but to be able to give a critical eye to information that they use in their work as students and as people in a society. So much like Gigi said, we teach curiosity and we teach critical thinking. and to kind of back up for a second, I want to just lay a little foundation as to why this is important and why there's a librarian uh, on this panel. And I mean, Twitter was one reason why is, you know, that kind of fun stuff. But um, I wanted to talk about some research that provides a foundation and it's from Project Information Literacy. And I'll pop it in the chat for you all if you want to take a look at the executive summary or the full study. And it was a study on how students find news and how news finds them. And some key findings of the study included that students get their news through a number of different channels, including their peers and their professors, as well as social media, and a little bit less so online newspapers and news feeds. That in this study, uh, more than two thirds of respondents said that the sheer number of news articles that they saw every day was so overwhelming, and that more than half agreed that it was so difficult to tell what the most important news stories were for the day because they were just bombarded with news sources um, and articles. Um, and I think one thing that both Gigi and Kelly have mentioned is that, um, that the study also mentions is that this tension exists between this idealized view of journalism and a distrust of today's news. And I think that's a lack of awareness of what journalistic ethics are um, and that not all media follow those same ethics. That eight in 10 students agreed that news is a necessary part of a democracy but the news, most said, had fallen short of their idealistic standards of, of what they thought journalists should be around accuracy and independence and fairness. Uh, this study also found that a wide gulf also exists between students news seeking behavior uh, for academic use uh, and personal use. So they don't apply the same skills in the classroom as they do in their personal lives and vice versa. And that that's just not transferring and they don't see the connection. And one takeaway from this research is that the criteria that we, that I and my colleagues teach students for assessing academic information has limited use when applied to these newer forms of media. So social media and news media, where currency and authority are a lot less defined than they have been in the past. That these traditional standards for evaluating news are increasingly problematic. So one typical method that librarians have taught for pretty much as long as I've been alive is called the CRAAP test. C-R-A-A-P, uh, standing for currency, reliability, authority, accuracy, and purpose. And a working paper came out just this week from the Stanford History Education Group called Educating for Misunderstanding. And it talked about the CRAAP test and how when we teach students to evaluate and to evaluate information in a very specific way, it's doing them a disservice with this new kind of information that's out there, unfortunately. So how do we actually then teach students and others how to effectively navigate this minefield of misinformation and deal with algorithmic bias and the commercial interests at stake in some of, um, some of the things going on and how to deal with clickbait and how we can just deal with all of this uh, when it's coming at us so fast. So what I would say is that we need to do more than crap. Uh, we need to do more than think about the currency, reliability, authority, accuracy, and purpose when we're looking at sources of information. We need to stop and think about our biases. We need to investigate sources. We need to find the right kind of coverage and we need to find the original sources to these claims. So one thing we do at the University of Minnesota Libraries is we have students look at a variety of sources. And we ask them to look at these sources around a specific research question. And we don't just use scholarly articles and books. We have students look at a Wikipedia page or and a tweet, a news article from a 
what we feel is a reliable source. Uh, one that we feel is maybe not quite as reliable. We also bring in um, other types of information. So we brought in TED Talks and summaries and those kind of things. And we have students have a conversation around what are the best and the worst sources. And in that, it kind of helps the students dislodge their prior conceptions of what makes a good and a bad source. And it gets them to understand that nuance and in information. And so while we're teach, teaching students that, I wanna um, end my part of the evening of talking about a few things that you can do to be a better citizen of information and um, things that you can apply in your daily lives that aren't super hard um, and they can just help you be a better news consumer. So the first is to find where you look for reliable information and find your trusted coverage. Have a, find, have a few places to look for information that you know are trusted sources that uh, subscribe to a code of ethics and make it holistic. Look at academic and popular local and national publications to really get a bigger view. Know the reputation of those sites and sources. Uh, reliability really depends on the question that you're trying to ask. I go to my doctor's nurse line for questions about my health versus WebMD after being told I was going to, you know, maybe die multiple times. Um, Another tip is to check for accuracy and trace information to the original source. So who are the uh, who are the people the author of your news is looking at? Reporters cite their sources, academics cite their sources. If it's just saying an anonymous source, if it's saying if they're not really saying who they got their evidence from, things might seem a little fishy to me. So, and then think about things like why was this written in the first place and where and can you easily find all of the pieces that this author is referencing? Um, for easy fact checking, PolitiFact and Wikipedia and Snopes are all fairly good sources for simple fact checking information. Uh, investigate the author of a source, know a little bit about them and where they're bringing bias into the conversation. In librarian speak, we say authority is constructed and contextual. And really that means is what makes something authoritative really depends on the conversation that's happening. Uh, there are simple skills and strategies that can be really helpful to you as a person uh, who's investigating information. Things like learning that there's other search engines that are less creepy than Google. Uh, DuckDuckGo happens to be my favorite uh, because it uses a different algorithm to give me search results. Learning how to use your effective keywords. And I don't mean having so much of an expertise as librarians do, but knowing synonyms and knowing what words are maybe not the right words to be using and that might get you better results. Using quotation marks in your search for a phrase. Simple things like that can give you better information when you're searching on the web. Uh, using things like the Wayback Machine to find how pages have changed over time, especially government websites to see how that information has changed with the change of um, the people in charge. Doing a reverse image search, uh, you can do these easily on Google. That tell, tells you where an image originally came from and if it's been, generally if it's been doctored. And searching within a page using control F um, can helps you find information fast in Wikipedia. And above all, my most important recommendation is to be responsible when sharing any information, is to stop and think about the emotional impact of it. Our hearts sometimes get in the way of our brains when we're reacting to information. And that you, you need to use your emotions as a reminder, that you need to go back and kind of take a look at some of those steps. That um, if you stop and spend a minute investigating what's behind the information that you're reading, you'll be on your way to be a better citizen of information. So thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. And thanks to Gigi and Kelly. So we are going to now move into a bit of a conversation. Um, and as Gigi said, there are no stupid questions. And just ask. And so there is down at the bottom of your Zoom, I think it's called Q&A. So go ahead and use the Q&A if you want us to ask a question and discuss it with the panelists. And, and we'll bring those up in a few minutes. Um, and I thought we would start, I wanted to ask Gigi, so in some of the conversations leading up to this, and it came up, I think, in just about everyone's um, talk about some of the context of um, the platforms so that the Star Tribune and other news 
organizations or advertising based and so on. And I just wonder if you would talk a little bit more about platforms like Facebook and Google and the sort of role they play in how we interact with news stories, especially we're talking about how algorithms can be actively manipulated and you brought up this concept of data voids. So when there's not enough information about a, a breaking news story, those voids can be filled. I wonder if you would start us off there. I'll do my best. I'm not an expert in data voids, but I do know um, that it's an important concept to understand. Um, a data void, as I understand it, is a moment of vulnerability that can exist on a search engine um, algorithm, although I think it also can, it, it, you know, I mean, it's relevant when it comes to a social media platform. A data void occurs when there are high levels of demand for information on a topic, but low levels of credible supply. So for example, breaking news is a kind of data void because um, breaking news often includes um, details that are new and never seen before, but many people are demanding information about it. So if someone goes to Google or YouTube and types in the details to search for information about the event, in, you know, junk might come up initially, or if someone is savvy or kind of attuned to that event, someone might try to exploit that data void by, if you're running a YouTube channel, putting out perhaps false information in order to draw people to the channel um, to profit off of it or to, uh, to tailor it for you know, one's interest if one is interested in, a, in some sort of conspiracy, you know, configuring it into a conspiracy that someone is interested in amplifying. It can be used as an opportunity to, use, uh, to, to pull people into fake news or other forms of um, <clears throat> disinformation. Um, and then a recent Neiman lab report uh, pointed out that data voids are, you know, as I say, usually associated with search engines like uh, Google or, or YouTube, which describes itself, I think, accurately as a search engine, but, but they can exist with social media posts as well. Um, and, and I can go ahead at some point, um, put that in the chat. I mean, data voids become relevant because they, they tend to amplify information, not only about breaking news events, and there's really a sort of a, a, a famous um, uh, sto uh, uh, case study on that with the shooting in Texas, where you know a, a shooting that occurred in the in, in a church in Texas, where immediately misinformation came out about the nature of that shooting um, because there was just no information about it. So it can be sort of tied to uh, um, anyone at that point, depending on someone's interest in developing fake news around it. But it also can lead to disinformation in areas of vaccination, and it certainly has played a role in the coronavirus um, misinformation early on, particularly. That's, that's the best I have to explain it. Does that, does that do it for you? That's great. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> um, and I wonder, sort of the flip side of that, and something Lindsay addressed was um, sort of this overall context of information overload that everyone is dealing with all the time. Um, there's now like a terminology related to doom surfing, like coronavirus doom surfing. There's so much bad news. There's so much going on. Um, we're just overwhelmed all the time. And I wonder, Kelly, if you would talk a little bit about like how are journalists and maybe at the Star Tribune or other news organizations, like how are you adjusting or responding to this situation of information overload or there's just so much news of all kinds out there? Yeah, well, I mean, as you mentioned, information overload isn't new. I think we've been talking about it since the internet came around, but certainly social media is really uh, making it a bigger problem and people are feeling overwhelmed because they're just scrolling Facebook, they're scrolling Twitter, they're scrolling Instagram every day and they don't know what to trust. Um, I got into a lift pre-pandemic after being at the U actually speaking at a journalism event and I got in the lift and the driver you know, at, was doing small talk and, and just said, you know, what do you do? And I said, I'm a journalist. She goes, oh, you know, you just can't trust anything anymore. There's just too much out there. And so I tried to, you know, have that conversation with her. Well, where, where is everywhere? Where are you looking? Are you just scrolling Facebook every day? And you're just overwhelmed by all that content. If you want to stop and just slow down, 
I hate to put a plug in, but uh, newspapers are a pretty great way to stop scrolling um, and just receive what is the most important news from that day. And you know, the Star Tribune and other major newspapers, we run Washington Post and New York Times stories. So you can get it all in one place. It's so convenient. Um, but at the Star Tribune, one of the things that we've done that we've mimicked from other newspapers is we have email newsletters. So you can sign up if you really want to care about, if you really care about hockey, for instance, there's a hockey newsletter. There's, you know, Gophers newsletter. There's a um, newsletter with kind of the top stories of the day. And so people subscribe to these if they want to just filter out what the news is that they care about. You know, my concern as a journalist is that people get these email newsletters and they just scan the headlines and they don't click on any of them. And so you're not very educated if you're just reading newsletter headlines or any headlines. If you're just scrolling Facebook and glancing at headlines, I hate to break it to you, but a headline does not tell you the full context of a story. So that's concerning to me as a journalist. The other thing that we do in print, at least, is we talk a lot about mix in the newsroom. And so the front page, for instance, um, you'll never see or very rarely see five political stories on the front page or five crime stories on the front page. Our editors try to mix it up so that it's, you're getting a variety of news. If it's a very intense news day, the fifth story on the front page is usually a lighter feature story or a slice of life story just to sort of lighten the load from the front page. Um, reporters are not part of any of these meetings that decide the front page, but the editors meet twice a day and they are very conscientious of, of all this information that's coming at us and feels dire, particularly in 2020 with the pandemic. So trying to balance that out. Excellent. Thanks, Kelly. And so Lindsay is sort of trying to combine a little bit of these um, together, thinking about both information overload and the platforms that students are using every day. So I'm also a librarian and I know that a lot of times we're asked to come to class to talk about academic sources, which are scholarly journal articles that 95% of the students will graduate and never read those kinds of sources again. I'm wondering, are there ways that you speak directly to um, this sort of media sphere or the platforms that we're using, the social media overload in sort of how you teach information literacy? Yeah, um, so there's a couple different things that um, I do personally and that I teach about. And one thing is, is you don't have to follow the same people on the same channels. That I kind of have my channels for different things where my Instagram is my friends and my family and, you know, kittens. And my Facebook is my friends and my family and maybe some more news sources kind of things. Um, and same with Twitter. That Twitter is where I go for my news because I can get an easy readable digest. And then I follow happy things sometimes as well, um, like alpaca farms and again, kittens, uh, to kind of break up the information that's coming at me because it's so overwhelming sometimes with all of this news. Um, I do also follow scholars and, you know, the U of M libraries post a lot of great stuff about what we're doing as well, but um, I like to break it up so that I'm not getting it from everywhere all the time. And that just is um, something. And I think um, diversifying the types of um, and having holistic sources that we look at. So knowing kind of my top three when it comes to news of the three sites I'll look at um, every day. And so the Star Tribune and Min Post and NPR are kind of my three local ones, knowing that they also cover national issues as well. And then I'll see other places because I want to know kind of what's happening on all the spheres. But um, just like when we're teaching students how to look for information in library databases where you're going to find different things in different types, I know what sources are going to have the kinds of information that I want. So if I want local news, I'm going to go to a more local source. My local newspaper also went away in the last year or so. And so I have to go to one of our bigger local newspapers, our Twin Cities newspapers for that. Thanks. So I'm going to switch over and start going through some of the questions we got from our audience. 
And let's start with uh, an anonymous attendee, not an anonymous source, but anonymous attendee who asks, so when I went to the U of M School of Journalism in the late 90s and early 2000s, I was taught news media was to be neutral and only deliver information, keeping edit opinions and editorial content to itself. So the question is, do you feel news has been more opinionated, more editorial um, now than ever before? So I'll just open up to the panelists. <laughs> Kelly, you want to take this one or should I? <laughs> I mean, you My know, answer is I, no. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, um, I think I think there's probably the impression that that is the case because um, of social media and because uh, journalists are out there tweeting and there's more um, sort of transparency in that regard. Um, and some of that has created, created um, uh, there's been incidents and, there's, and, and news organizations have had to get familiar with how to manage that and figure out their policies around that. Um, um, but, but I think on the whole, and there also, there's, there is more noise. There are more sort of, um, there's more, uh, um, there, there's more going on in terms of there are more news sites, there's more partisanship generally. So with regard to that, you have the sense that there's sort of more happening. And I would go back to what I raised in when I spoke, what do you mean by the news media? I mean, if you mean the, the cable TV at in the evening, yes. The answer is yes. If you were to turn that on in the 90s, you would not see the kind of display that you have now. And, and that is because there's a certain marketing of, of outrage and anger and, and a lot of, of divisiveness. But, but I think what you have to really look at is what do you mean by news media? I mean, is the Star Tribune, ha, has the Star Tribune abandoned its journalistic principles? No, it still publishes and follows you know, those guidelines that it has been following for years. And likewise with other news, news organizations as well. So mm, those principles that, that were conveyed in, in the 90s and 2000s are absolutely the same. That's what we teach, but the, the, the landscape has changed. I think that's what, what we're seeing. Do you agree, Kelly? Yeah, okay. I that's perfect. That one, but, yeah, okay. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, you know, we have a series of rapid fire questions that I think we can sort of get through quickly, um, but would be really nice to share back with some folks. So one question is about actually before we go rapid fire, maybe a little larger question that Lindsay might um, want to touch on is, so should some exposure to media literacy skills be required as part of an undergraduate degree? Um, and I think Gigi certainly should weigh in with thumbs up. Absolutely. Um, if I had the power, I would say no, but we're actually actually starting that kind of right now. So it's more under the umbrella of information literacy, which is kind of the librarian side of things. Um, this is the first we have a huge partnership with our first year writing program in the College of Liberal Arts this fall. Um, and it builds on a partnership we've had for a number of years that my colleague Kate Peterson started um, and other colleagues as well that we are they have a fully online first year writing course this year obviously because of covid and we have now um, integrated into each of their big projects for their um, big, their big writing projects so one looks at source source authority and how we have to use we have to investigate our authors as we read about them uh, the second one looks at this idea that scholarship is a conversation, that conversations change over time and we cite different sources for different purposes. And then the third one really looks at research as exploration, where we're looking at that activity that I described earlier, of uh, the different types of sources and ranking them from best to worst within a context of a research question. So we're starting there. We haven't fully taken over yet. But um, it's really exciting that we're hitting 80 sections of a writing class this year um, to be able to start that process and get students to start learning more and become less novice on these ideas. That's great. And 
again before there's so many good questions now i keep um adjusting what i want to do here but there are a couple can I, that can i just add one thing yeah please that um you know hopefully it obviously students should be learning media literacy but so should everyone who's an adult you know ages 10 through 100 should be learning this if there's one takeaway that i'd want people who are attending this tonight to know it's whether or not you are consuming journalism every day you're probably most likely on social media or you have access to the internet and if you have a social media account the role has really shifted now to you if you're on Instagram or Facebook and you're scrolling, you need to vet information before you share it or you are contributing to misinformation. And just to clarify, misinformation is information that is false that you inadvertently share, whereas disinformation is information that is false that you are choosing to share because you know it's false to cause harm. And so this is happening on social media more and more. Just to give a quick example, um, you know, when the um, fires were going on in Australia, there were lots of Instagram photos, dramatic photos of these fires in Australia. There's this photo of this girl with a gas mask holding a koala bear. Fires are raging behind her. There's another photo of a family in the water as fires are, you know, all surrounding them. And people share these constantly on Instagram and, and maybe you shared it yourself. But the problem is that they were they were inaccurate. The the koala bear photo was completely photoshopped. The family in the water was real, but it was taken in 2013. And so Lindsay mentioned earlier about reverse Google image searching. Um, if someone had done that, they would have found a Time Magazine article from 2013 showing that family in the water. So it's up to you before you like a post or share a post to verify is that real. Excellent. Thanks. So there are also two questions that sort of uh, get to trust. So one is about there's a recent controversy at a local public broadcasting news outlet, left a bad taste in my mouth. Now I'm skeptical of a previously trusted source. So um, how can we restore trust in media or certain media sources? And then another question about a certain political figure who is supposed to be an authority, but in a lot of senses in terms of facts is anything but. And so who do we trust? How do we choose what media sources to trust? I wonder if anyone could touch on that. I just will say quickly, um, you know, if, if, if you, you trust a, a media source and the media source has done something that you're concerned about, um, I, I would take it up with the editor and really have a conversation with the editor. I mean, um, rather than just take it at face value, based on reporting that you're reading, and, but, not, but not really investigating. Um, because uh, chances are pretty good that the story is more complicated than you know. And if you're, if you're wanting to trust that source, I would take your concern directly to the editor and see what kind of response you get. That's my... Excellent. I mean, you know, I mean, it, 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 you, that, that's about it. I mean, it, it, news organizations struggle, they make mistakes, um, and uh, they're not going to be perfect. So, uh, you know, they can just do their best. Sometimes things are more complicated than, than you realize, but you just have to sort of decide. Um, but that would be my advice. I mean, you, you can't get, it, it's not a perfect world. I don't Great. even know what you're talking about. Yeah, go ahead. Kelly or Lindsay, was there anything done? Okay. No, I mean, I just echo that what Gail said that, uh, you know, we all do screw up every day. We have corrections that are printed when we make an error um, or make a mistake. And and I do know that when people lose trust in, in journalists, it, it scars them. I deal with sources before who are like, oh, you know, I was burned by a news outlet. I don't want to ever talk to a journalist again. And that happened once with a source and it took months of getting her to trust me and explaining what I do as a journalist and showing her my past work before she finally trusted me to talk to me again. Excellent. There is another question about um, media outlets use of anonymous sources. Should that data continue to be used? Should it be discarded? What's the value of anonymous sources? Yeah, so at the Star Tribune, like a lot of other mainstream media organizations, we have a pretty high bar for anonymous sources. I've been there for 10 years and I probably have used 
one, maybe two anonymous sources in that 10 years. So in order to do an anonymous, to include an anonymous source in a story, we have to get approval from our very top editors, like, you know, five layers of editors need to sign off on this. And one misconception about anonymous sources, people think that we're meeting in, you know, dark garages and, and meeting with people, we have no idea who they are. No, we always know who the anonymous source is. And so, you know, I know their full name so that I can verify they're actual human, they're, they're exactly who they say they are. So, and I have to share that with my editors, even if we're not going to run that um, anonymous source. But, you know, when I advise students for a student newspaper, I always tell them, you know, if, if someone's life or job is in jeopardy, then it might be allowed. But in basically any other case, you shouldn't resort to that because it does reduce credibility in the media. Thank you, Kelly. Um, and so I do want to hand it back to Lisa, but I will point to Lindsay especially. There's a number of questions in the Q&A about what browser did you mention? How do you do a reverse image search? Um, so any of the panelists that have time, we have about four minutes left as we're wrapping up. It would be great if we could add some of those resources to the chat. Um, um, for everyone who attended. And I just wanna, yeah, thank everyone so much for sharing. And um, it was a really pleasure to be here. So Kelly and Gigi and Cody and Lindsay, thank you so much for what was a wonderful, wonderful evening. And thank you um, to all of you who asked questions of our panelists. Um, today's program is sponsored by the Friends of the Libraries as a part of the Friends Forum uh, series for curious minds. For those friends who are here today, we appreciate your support and I say thank you. And for those who are not friends, well, we invite you to join us. Our next program will be December 1st when our Mapping Prejudice Project presents on their community-based work to reveal racial covenants in the Twin Cities housing deeds. I hope you all have a good evening um, and thank you for participating and please stay safe and well. Bye-bye. <laughs>